This is About to Drop, a podcast where I interview independent artists about music that they're about to release. In each episode, I'll have a conversation with a new artist to talk about where they came from, how they got started in music, and most importantly, what they're going to be releasing next. We'll cover all sorts of topics, including the writing process, recording, producing, and even things like marketing, branding, and promotion. So thanks for tuning in, and let's get started with the episode. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of About to Drop. I'm your host, Baro, aka Vertigo, and I'm here today with Tom Callahan, founder and CEO of Indie Advance and music industry veteran. He's had a lot of different titles, so we're probably going to touch on all of them and, you know, try and gather some insight and, you know, and in his various roles. Uh, so how are you doing today, Tom? Great, Carlos. Great to see you. And uh, I know we've had a couple of conversations in the past. And it's, it's really great to be on your show. I appreciate the, appreciate the offer. As always. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate you coming on. Um, like I said in my email previously, most of the episodes are geared more towards like indie artists and just kind of... Mm-hmm getting a gauge on, you know, what they're doing. Uh, it gives them a platform to kind of talk about their story and their music and promote, you know, upcoming works and stuff. But lately I've been trying to get other folks in the industry just to kind of round out what the show uh, covers uh, and also just get like, a different perspective on the other side of what, you know, of the business and things like that. Um, but yeah, why don't we start from the very beginning? Can you, um, can you tell me a little bit about how you got started in music in the first place? Um, you you yeah, were start, like you played music as well, right? Before before getting yeah yeah. Also, uh, well, it's I'll do a Reader's Digest version because it's uh, it's I'm old, <laughs> it's long. Um, I started touring uh, in 1982. I came from Boston to California. I grew up in Boston, and it was a music major in college. It was a college dropout. Um, started playing uh, professionally at 17 or 18. Um, toured for a few years. Met my wife. Uh, got in the record business in 86 or 87, working for um, great uh, some great labels. Uh, the first one was Enigma Records, the independent record label Enigma. Then from there, I went to IRS Records and worked for Miles Copeland, and really cut my teeth and really learned a lot during that time in the late 80s. And then in 1990, I went to Virgin Records. And during most of those times, I was doing radio promotion. Although with Miles Copeland at IRS, I was his special projects manager as well and worked with some of his um, traditional, I mean, really classic rock artists like Robbie Krieger from The Doors, um, Mountain, Wishbone Ash, Spirit, kind of really classic 60s bands. And then uh, also with Miles, got to work with his little joint venture with Sting. He had a label um, and just a few acts on it. So I got to help run that. And then from Virgin... Uh, I left in 1992 to start my own business, which was a radio promotion business and a little record label called Coyote Records and a little management company. And, and sort of that, that progression sort of never stopped. <laughs> that was in 1992. So I've been independent for a long time. Um, you know, managed a bunch of artists throughout the years um, from Jeff Timmons at 98 Degrees and Pop to... Um, Kaylee Go, who I got signed to Jason Plum um, at, at Lava, uh, to Justin Hopkins, who and David Boyles, both international deals. I got them. Um, just a lot of artists. Jordan Hill, my God, the list goes on and on. Arnold McCullough from James Taylor's band. Uh, and then uh, most recently, the last thing I did um, before I started Indie Advance, uh, I helped start the company, a uh, song trader licensing company uh, and I was there for three three and a half years we started in Paul Wilshire at the founder's garage I'm um, sorry his living room and um, and of course that company's massive right now and uh, so I left that three and a half uh, I left that about three years ago 2017 I, I think I left 2000 yeah 2017 so then I took a couple of years off and uh, I started in the advance about a year ago yeah okay yeah there's a ton of stuff to cover I know. Sorry about that. I told you I'm old. It's, I got the white in the beard, so I'm getting all. I mean, I'll see it. I'm starting to get all the white in here now. No, yeah, yeah, you're baby stuff. <laughs> um, but yeah, well, you know, just going back to like the, the very, very beginning. Um, so you were a musician for a while. How did you get yep. into playing music in the first place? Like, did your did you have, have an interest on your own? Did your parents kind of put you into it? Do you come from a family of musicians? Yeah, family of musicians on both sides, fathers and mothers' side. 
oddly enough, neither direct parent are musicians, but my mom's side of the family is all musicians professionally. My dad's side of the family has several, uh, one of which was a huge influence in me. And so when and I'm half Sicilian and half Irish on the Sicilian side, my mom's side, um, we had the Sunday dinners like typical family, uh, lots of Sicilian, lots of people, and everybody had an instrument. And it was always music and food and um, very close family. And uh, so playing music was just part of our lifestyle. It was, it was always sports and music. And I never learned how to change my car tires. I never learned how to beat a, put a piece of, a nail on a piece of wood. I never learned a lot of other things, which I probably mm. should have. And, and I learned a little bit later in life, but um, it was always just music and martial arts and, and sports and things. And that was really the only two things I ever knew. Uh, so yeah. And, and how old were you when you started playing an instrument? My first professional job that I got paid for was nine years old on drums. Oh wow! And I I played I played for a um, a school not my school but a school's um like function and they paid me I don't know like twenty bucks or something mm -hmm. I don't know I was I was one of those uh, young kids that was uh, walked from Lexington to Concord playing the big fife and drum corps. Uh huh. So okay. I did that as well. Yeah. You know. My brother's uh my brother Kevin Callahan is a big classical composer, a very well known classical composer. So we both. Uh, grew up playing music and played together and played in bands and you know did the whole thing that most of you guys have done you know yeah yeah so um, so yeah so you you went touring for a while and then you transitioned on to like more like the business side of things I did how how did how did that happen and like what you know what were the reasons for making that transition great question it was a tough it was it was, it was a decision that I never was never really a um it sort of evolved, but I remember that I remember the serious decision I made. But then, you know, you say stuff and then you don't follow through. And this is one of the weird things I did. To, I actually followed through on, and I didn't really anticipate following through on it. I was um, I was playing solo. My band had broken up. My touring band had broken up, and I went to Seattle for a year and I studied jazz piano for a while at Cornish Institute. And I was writing a lot of music then. And my brother was in Seattle, so we were playing together a lot. And um, came back down and I was playing in a funk band and I was playing solo and I was having meetings at labels with my solo stuff. And um, that funk band I was playing in um, was a 10 piece funk band as little Richard's drummer, the untouchable sax player, um, the Ohio players, bass player. I was on keyboards um, and I was playing solo guitar at night uh, at a couple at a pub a couple of nights a week. And I was having meetings at record labels that, and I was coming very close, you know, and with, and then the rock, the funk band said, Oh, we're going to go open up for Prince in Italy. And then we're going to go through Europe. If he likes you, I mean, go to London. If he likes you go through uh, Europe, that fell through my solo stuff was coming close. It just wasn't happening. And in the meantime, I was 24 and a half at that point, I think, and I've been touring for four, three, four years at that point. So I was burnt out. I met, this woman who I fell in love with instantly and we were living together after six months and she sat up in bed one morning and said, you know, I don't think I can have a serious relationship with a musician. And that's my current wife. I've been to, with 35 years. And, and uh, so I actually said, you know what? I was so sort of depressed with my music at that point. Um, you know, you just feel like, Oh, I'm never going to make it. I'm sure a lot of you guys who are listening to this have been there or are there now. Um, and, and, I had this stupid notion, which I hope you guys don't have, and if you do, get past it, that I was too old. You know, oh, I was already 24 and a half. I've done all this stuff. I, you know, I opened up for a bunch of bands. I come close and, you know, it's like, you know, I'm just never going to make it. That was my kind of attitude. And I didn't want to lose this woman I was with. And I was having, you know, I was, I was um, and so, you know, I, I sold some equipment, kept some, of course, but then started looking to get in the record business. I had very few contacts. Uh, but I had a few and I ended up working as an intern at 25 years old, not even getting, getting paid. And I uh, was still playing, of course, and, and things like that. And I had like three jobs then. I was playing music at night. I was tending bar part time and I was working uh, as an intern. And then after a couple of months, a, a position opened up at the record label. Uh, it was a temporary position. So they filled, they put me in that position, started paying me. And then when that position was ending, they asked me to stay in that position and move the person that was currently in there to another position. And I did, I stayed. And then my career started that way. But it was really, really hard. 
very hard <laughs> to make that transition. And for the first couple of years, quite honestly, I was really, I think I look back on it now, I'm 60 now, and I was looking back at that and I probably was going through a depression and I was very conflicted. Like I was depressed that I wasn't playing music because as we all know who are musicians that there's nothing like playing in a band and playing on stage and the camaraderie and the fun and the music and there's nothing like it, you know? And I did miss it for the first couple of years. And I would, I would jump on stage with people and I would play. And actually, I continue to do that. I still play, you know, but, um, and I really, I don't miss it like I used to miss it, but, and I made the right decision for myself, but, um, but that's sort of how I made that transition. And it was a very difficult time in my life, I think, a very great time because my wife, my girlfriend at the time, and a very difficult time because I knew I was kind of giving up my dream and all I ever dreamed about when since a kid was uh, playing music, you know, and so. Yeah, I, I can actually, I can actually relate to that uh, pretty well. I, from like a young age, I, the, the goal was to be just a touring musician, right? Play in a band, just be on the road, like just playing shows. Um, took years to get there and I finally did with the band I was playing with. We were touring across the country uh, and I had like just met my now wife at the time and we were getting serious. Yeah. We moved in together. Wow. Uh, and then it was like, you know, I think the third tour we were on, I was like, you know, what? I don't think I like being in a bus <laughs> yeah. for weeks on end. You know, I miss my girlfriend at the time. Like we have a nice place. Like I don't need to be sleeping here, playing the same set every night. Um, but I'm glad I did it. Cause I feel like I got it out of my system. I, you know, check something off the list I wanted to do. I don't have any regrets about not pursuing it further. I mean, we weren't doing like Madison Square Garden or anything like that, but um, I feel like I got it out of my system and I can still make music and be creative and, you know, follow, you know, my passions really. Um, but yeah, no, I, I can get, you know, but believe it or not, this is the, this, for, for this is the gen, this is the genesis of becoming a manager because I understood the plight you know, the artist. And um, I really did want to help, genuinely wanted to help musicians because I didn't have a mentor growing in the business. I mean, as a musician, I mean, I was booking my own band until we got the major, until we got the agent. I was running the business with, you know, uh, a couple of other guys in the band. It was just, it was a lot of work, but I learned and I realized, you know, I really want to help musicians uh, um, understand the business better. It was, so it was the genesis of me managing artists, starting a record label, and ultimately, which led me to what I'm doing now with Indie Advance, which to, is to advance the cause for indie musicians, you know, independent musicians. And um, and I, I really want uh, it came from a it came from the right place. That's why I'm so passionate about it. You know, that I really want to help create a middle class, um, if if possible, that people like you and I who are doing this could actually make a living doing it, and not play Madison Square Garden, yeah. for example. Uh, which which really didn't exist back then. It was really tough, tough life. And it's still, it's starting to change now for the better, but it's still really difficult. And um, so, like, yeah, the idea of Indie Advance was to really create uh, a home for these musicians and create a hub uh, for other companies to come under our umbrella and to ultimately, um, you know, really help the musician and have services, distribution, licensing, you know, all the things that a musician needs at affordable costs uh, and sometimes no cost, depending on what we're doing and how we bundle things. But um, uh, but yeah, so that was that's that's sort of how I came up in the business in my philosophy and 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 uh, my mindset uh, of being in the business of music as opposed to being uh, a musician. Sure. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, let's let's talk a little bit more about Indie Advance. Um, so, how how did the company come about? I mean, not, you know you. Obviously, there's like the, the, these gaps you're trying to fill and creating a you yeah. know working class uh, for for music or a, a middle class for, for musicians. Um, but like, how did the the whole company start up? And that's uh, that's a little bit of an interesting story as well. I was um, I used to live in Manhattan Beach in California, and I had a good buddy there that was not in the music business. And we we're just having a beer one night, and um, and he was moving to the Philippines to do uh, start a company called uh, Staff Virtual, which he still has. He was going to move to the Philippines with one of his buddies who's an attorney and one or two other guys. I forget why they were going, but they're all going to kind of go to the Philippines. He sold his car. You know, this is like this is in 2009. Mm-hmm. So he's like, so we're having a beer and he says, hey, we should put something together. I said, well, you know, here's an idea. You know, I, I kind of sketched out in the advance and he had some great ideas as well. And he said, hey, why don't we, I'm going to have a staff 
of Filipinos, like a call center. And I said, yeah, they could scour the internet. The internet was, was, wasn't new, but it was still up and coming. And, and they could scour the internet for bands all over the world. And then we could feed you bands and then yada, yada, yada. So I owned 50% of the company and the other four guys owned 50% of the company. So what happened is they got down in the Philippines. He got super busy building his staff virtual, which was really for transcriptions for lawyers, transcriptions for doctors, things like that, um, using the Filipino uh, workforce. And I was doing really well as an independent at the time, well, consulting and, and doing really well financially. And so we built the website in 2009. You can still find it up there and even find the old Facebook page, which is impossible to put down. And I thought it was a really good idea then. We had packages, we had cartoon characters. It was really cool, uh, but nothing ever happened to it. So uh, fast forward till last year, I had been semi-retired. I'm teaching karate around the world. Uh, the pandemic hits, I have to stop teaching because the dojos are all closed. And one of my students is a singer, musician, and um, and she found out that I was in the music business because no one, I'd only been living here in Boulder for those four years and I came out here just to, to retire basically and teach. So she really didn't know anything about my music background. And then she found out about it and then found out about Indie Advance and, and said, hey, you know, Tom, you should really, really get that company back up and running because it's a great idea and it's gonna help a lot of musicians like herself and all other friends of hers. So that was the genesis of the reimagining of Indie mm -hmm. Advance. And we rebuilt it, uh, rebuilt the site and and uh, and changed a bunch of stuff around. And it's still evolving, to be honest with you. And the original distribute and the original Indie Advance did not have distribution because it didn't exist back then mm -hmm. for most intents and all intents and purposes. But so yeah, we we reimagined it, rebuilt it. Um, and like I said, it's still evolving, but it's at a place now where we're working like crazy and we're getting great, uh, great publicity. And, and right now I'm funding it myself and we just start, started looking for seed money and, and or series A money uh, about literally a week ago. So we're just starting that process, uh, looking for money to help grow the company and scale the company. Gotcha. And how does Indie Advance differ from like, um, like a, a record label? Yeah, that's, a, that's also a good question. And I get people saying to me, you know, Tom, this is sort of like a digital record label. I said, yeah, it sort of is. But with the record label, of course, um, um, they loan money to the artist and then they get, get re, it's a recoupment and then they give a royalty rate to the artist. We don't do any of that. We're strictly a service-based company. So the artist owns all their rights, their master they own, their publishing they own, all their IP. So we don't touch anything. We don't take any back-end royalty. Even with when we do licensing for artists, we just do a 50-50 fee split. They get the royalties in the back end and of course half their upfront fee. Um, so we provide functions and services like labels, but we don't own anything. Um, and you're you're free to come and go. You know what I mean? We know there's no contractual obligations unless we do, which we have with three artists right now, we do a project management agreement, which is usually three to six months, depending. Um, but that's a little different. That's a, that's a monthly retainer to basically act as a manager for the artist, including everything. We do everything. And that's a monthly retainer. But most part, most uh, times they come and they want to do licensing. They want to do distribution. They want to have a website built. They want to have education. Uh, they want to they want to talk to us for an hour. We have consulting fees that are really low, but they get to pick our brain, understand what uh, how the business works, and they might be talking to Michael Jetnisk, our business affairs guy. Uh, if they're talking to licensing, they might be talking to Natalia, our operations director. They might be talking to me. They can pick and choose who they want to chat with in our with either our board of advisors or within our in our company itself. So um, you know, we're starting a streaming our own personal streaming uh, service which uh, will be for independent artists as well, called Mad Genius Radio. Um, so we have a lot of plans. Uh, a lot of the plans are going to be predicated on us raising money, of course, because a lot of it costs money to develop in, in the tech and things like that. But we have a lot uh, a lot in the pipeline, a good roadmap. And um, yeah, uh, in a year, I think uh, that this company will look a lot, you know, pretty different. Uh, foundationally the same, but we'll be offering a lot more things. Gotcha. So, it's kind of, so it's kind of like a la carte as the artist needs. Yes, exactly. exactly. I didn't have it that way originally. And I realized we had bundles and packages and this price point for these four or five things, et cetera, et cetera. And then I realized that the artists that kept coming to me um, really wanted to customize their, 
their services and their in their packages. So I started saying, you know, let's just do everything a la carte. Uh, we will bundle some things. You know, most artists come. You know, they need distribution, they need licensing, they need some education, they need, um, um, you know, uh, whatever education, whatever project management, but whatever. And then we start just building a package together. Um, it's going to be a little more difficult as we scale, but we have a lot of automation technology that we're starting to build in, um, it's specifically on the educational part. Where and there'll be there'll be a probably small subscription on some areas if you choose to do that. That will allow you to have free distribution, and that will be maybe you know educational uh, videos every month or every couple of weeks uh, based on. I mean, there's going to be all there's all kinds of things. I can't. I don't want to divulge too much because people are always stealing stealing ideas. <laughs> I don't really care though anymore. But uh, but yeah, I'm excited about how we're going to be able to help the artists going forward. That's really cool. Um, yeah. You know, I, I did have a question too. I mean, you've obviously been in the industry for so long and in so many different roles. Um, do you see any sort of patterns or anything that, like reoccurring events or anything that, you know, indie artists can be uh, mindful of, like in the future? Like, like um, for example, um, like, do you have any predictions about where the industry is headed? based off your experience in the past, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, I do, actually. I really think this direct artist-to-fan engagement is critical. I think this is what everyone's, the challenge everyone's trying to really figure out. Um, and, you know, I know SoundCloud's doing some tipping stuff. There's another company called YFM, who I'm partnering with, that's doing a lot of this uh, live streaming with direct fan tipping. Uh, which, which, you know, generates a, a closeness with the artist. Um, and then that can exponentially grow. Uh, I'm partnering with the company right now, actually in an equity swap kind of a situation where um, I don't want to mention the company's name yet. They're just, they haven't even launched yet, but um, where we're aggregating all of the artists' social media together on a dashboard in real time. So you'll see the YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, um, Spotify, everything right there. And the artist has access to it immediately without having to navigate away. Okay, and yeah. the, the dashboard can be right there. And that's going to be part of Indie Advance as well, um, which I think is going to be huge for us because I think uh, obviously social media is a huge thing for artists. And most, a lot of these artists will come to me and they go, you know, uh, I've got great Instagram. I have shit Facebook or vice versa or Spotify. I kick it on these playlists and uh, I've, I hired this person and they're using bots and it's really screwed the algorithms up. And you know. So one of the reasons I set Indie Advance up as well was because everyone that works here is obviously quite is vetted by me. Not only that, but these are people I've pretty much worked with a, a long time. And these guys have all been successful and they've all seen the do's and don'ts, they've, um, they've seen what works, what doesn't work. And unfortunately, a lot of the artists, um, you know, they start searching the internet and they find, oh, this guy looks good. He had a cup of coffee in the business. He had this, he had this artist once or whatever. And um, they, the, art, uh, the, the consultant uh, is really sort of a scam artist or a fraud and they're getting paid and they really don't know anybody. They don't have the relationships. They don't have the experience. Um, and that's really hurts the artist. And then, of course, it puts a bad taste in the artist's mouth with other consultants and other companies like mine. So then I have to, you know, then, so I suggest these indie artists that are watching this in fact, to really look at, do your due diligence and everybody, it doesn't have to be indie advanced, but whomever you're looking at uh, to work with, um, uh, please do your due diligence. Really go deep, find out who these people are, what their background is. With the internet, you can pretty much find it. So Take your time and be patient when you're looking for people to work with in the industry. Yeah, that's great advice. I mean, I've I have artists that have signed up with these managers or consultants and yeah. things like that, and they get looped into these deals that are they don't get shit out of it, you know. And then, then yeah, no. bad taste in their mouth, and it it can be really discouraging. Yeah, you know, and it hurts it hurts companies like mine as well. And I've, I I'm doing I'm dealing with this as we speak with an artist, and it looks like we'll be doing a deal this week, but. I've had several Zoom calls. He's met the team, my core team, um, and now looks like he's coming with us. He's a wonderful artist. I'm, I, and I, a lot of times I won't spend much time with an artist if they keep just, you know, you know, artists can be difficult to work with. I was one, you were one. Mm -hmm. um, but 
this particular artist is so talented and it's like, I want to do everything I can to make sure he uses us because he's been burned before mm -hmm. and he's a Nashville guy and he's been burned several times. It's like, it's too bad. I felt really bad. And I want this guy to come with us because I know we will do a good job for him. And I know that we're transparent. We, we, we always work hundred percent effort. Um, of course, there's no guarantees with anything, but I can guarantee that, um, that he will get the attention he deserves and he will be able to use my relationships and, and our relationships. And he will be talking to people that have done it before. Every one of my team have had massive hits, uh, successful hits. And um, so that I hope uh, is what I always try to convey to the artist. And, um, you know. mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it's tough to kind of like try and walk them back and get them to, to try again after they've been burned. Um, yeah. You know, one question, another question I had was after, you know, working with and, and signing and developing and managing, you know, artists over the years, aside from just, just talent, like, are there any, any constants that has stayed when, that you find for good artists when, when you sign them or that have any success? And are there any new things that like newer artists need to have that may not have been present in the past? Yeah. Yeah. That, that is, something I bring up all the time and, the, and that answer, the answer is work ethic, right? Self-discipline. Um, and I see it both ways where artists haven't been self-disciplined and signed too. So you can, you can pick and choose what you want, but the constant to, to use your term is, um, is really the work ethic. They have to, and this is why I, I, I go back to what I said earlier about the educational component. I think the education of the artist is really critical because it's foundationally important for the artist to understand how the business works in order for them to ask the right questions. If you're an informed artist, then you know how to, um, what to question um, and, and how to orchestrate your career. And you may have heard me say this in other podcasts or may I say it in the martial arts as well about orchestrating your career, not just navigating it. You're always navigating. But until you're orchestrating your own career, um, you're, you're still at a slight disadvantage. When you're navigating, that means you're reacting. And when you react uh, without a foundational edu uh, an educational foundation, um, you're, you're, it's hit or miss. But when you're orchestrating your career based on a educational, uh, with, based on knowledge that you have, then you're more, most more, more, much, much more likely to succeed uh, because you're coming from an informed place. And now you're orchestrating your, your career. So um, second to that question is, is, the, is the work ethic, the, the self-discipline that it used to be, to go back to what you're saying, it used to be that, yeah, the manager handled everything and you just smoked, smoked a joint and, got, you know, and, and wrote songs and, and, the, and the, your team worked everything out for you. But with social media now, I, I don't want to answer. I don't want to be your personality. You have to do that. You have to understand how the social media works. You have to know when to post, how to post, how to create your image. How do you want to be presented to the world? And is that going to be consistent as well? One day you're doing this, one day you're doing that, and your fans are going, well, who is this guy? Now, that said, if you are a multi-instrumentalist or you have a lot of different um, influences musically, um, I know you want to. You don't want to be boxed in as an artist necessarily, but initially you might want to pick a lane. I mean, this is all stuff that we discuss in strategy, right? Strategy calls. Um, but I think you have to be really cognizant and aware of who you are as an artist and how you want to present yourself. Um, and then you can always take that fan with you. But um, yeah, it's really important to to know who you are as an artist and where you want to go, and. To, to put the effort in yourself. And it's truly, when you work with India Advance, it's really truly a partnership uh, in terms of we help guide you, strategize, help you with, you know, we help you with everything, but we listen. And then, uh, and if we feel like based on our experience, like, you know, you're, you're maybe going off the rails a little bit here and, and um, with, with regard to energy, times, money, all these things, then um, we help maybe come help you steer and get back on lane, get back in your lane. I'm going to change my headphones right here. Hold on a second. Okay. Sure. Sorry. Oh, just changing them up here. Let's see if this works. Are you there? Yeah. Can you hear me? I can hear you here. I think that this might kick in in a second. I can still hear you from the speakers. Can you hear okay. me now? 
Uh, yeah, I can still hear you. Okay. All right, let's just do it this way. Okay. Um, all right, so what, um, well, for a lot of indie artists or, or folks that you may be bringing into indie advance, um, do you see any common uh, mistakes people are making or things that you need to either correct or, or, or adjust for them? Yeah, mistakes is a hard, difficult word because, you know, anything can happen at any time in, in any circuitous route, right? And, and there's no one way to, to make it in the business. So I don't like to look at whatever they're doing as mistakes necessarily, but I only have one thing I can go on personally and my team can go on and that's experience. And we do have our feet on the ground as well. Um, we're very contemporary. We're not like, even though some of us are older, I have young people in this company as well. And we all have our feet in the ground. I, you know, I'm, you know, I'm still very active in the, in the, in the contemporary business. So when I, when I see mistakes, I might, I might just bring them back a little bit and say, well, if you do this, this is the potential can happen. If you do it the other way, this may be a better way because X, Y, Z. So I, I don't try to tell anybody what to do just because I said so. That kind of a thing, like you're, you know, your parents, why? Because I said so. You know, I try to explain and give options and give scenarios of why and what and how and things like that. Um, I know some people say, hey, I'm going to release a new song every four weeks. Um, and sometimes I say, well, that may aggregate wise be okay. Um, Spotify spins and, you know, and, 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 um, and things like that. But if you have a great song, you know, I think it may be good to spend some time marketing that one song. I mean, it's impossible to market a, a new song every four weeks. It's just really impossible to do it, to do it the way to go deep onto a, into a marketing campaign and to actually try to break um, so these are the conversations I am having all the time. Do we take one of those nine songs you just keep releasing and focus on one? Maybe going to college radio, maybe uh, maybe putting your you know what any kind of campaign for a song together with the video, um, or you just throwing shit against the wall to see what sticks. I mean, it's a conversation. It's always a conversation, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. I suppose one, it depends on like what the artist has already done and what their goals are yeah, and, and all, that all those things. All those things. Where you know, what, what's his following already like? Has he played live? Has he ever put a band together? Is he is he writing? Is he get placements already? Or she, of course. Um, um, you know, where is his, where is the focus of that particular artist, and how do we best get there and, and accomplish their idea? And then how do we take that and, and grow it, and grow it, and grow it, and expand, expand? And you know, what's their ultimate goal? Do they want to get a major label deal, and they want to stay independent? You know, some people don't want a major label deal. Some people do. And um, there's different approaches for either of those scenarios. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've, I've been hearing and seeing more and more, you know, indie artists wanting to take control of their entire career and not go with a major or anything. Um, do you see That's, more, do you see that as more of a, a shift of people moving in that direction or do you still, yeah, totally. most people still want to go with a major? Well, uh, I see the shift for sure. And that's what India Advance is here to, to cater to that clientele uh, globally. But, you know, I, I've, I've seen this many times, actually. The independent, the really strong independent artist, like, no, I'm freaking indie. I'm uh, fuck this. And, oh, Universal wants to sign me? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, here's the... Uh, to have us to be a Justin Bieber or a Gaga, I mean, there's only there's a couple of exceptions, obviously, but you still need that massive top 40 radio. You still, um, you know, I'm not, I think this will change at some point. Uh, but if you're looking right now, um, there's not a lot of superstar independent artists. There's a couple of them, obviously, and in the hip hop world and stuff too. Um, but it's not easy to do that. And a lot of it has to do with radio, terrestrial radio. A lot of it has to do with the machine, the big labels can still do, and the strings they can pull. Um, but you don't have, you, your, your success, financial success and reward as an artist, you don't have to have the mass success and the mass a major label does to have the same amount of monetary rewards and you control your own destiny as an independent artist. So I think people are wising, wising up to this and starting to understand, well, if I have a 12 point royalty rate and I have to sell all these records or I have to do all these things, I mean, not records anymore, obviously, but 
have to do this so much touring and I have to have so much radio play and I have to do this and do that just to break even and recoup the recording cost or, you know, whatever versus doing it all myself independent. I only need a thousand fans and I can make a decent living if you think about it. Right. Um, So anyway, that's sort of the difference. But a lot of the major labels now are even partnering with, uh, with uh, independent artists, if the independent artist has shown uh, a significant amount of growth. And this is one of the things we also do with independent artists, help you sell, set up your LLC, help you set up your publishing entity, things of this nature. So if you do decide to do a joint venture, if it's possible and you get lucky enough and things are line up that with Republic or, or Interscope member, whatever it is, and they said, look, we want to partner with you. Your business is set up already mm-hmm. and you're not going to get ripped off, you know? Right. So. Hmm. So what's in the, uh, obviously you can't give away any of the, uh, the secret stuff, but, um, what do you see as like the future for Indie Advance? Like, um, from where it is maybe in five years, what would you like it to be doing? Be sold. To oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, I mean, I'm 60 years old. Uh, I, uh, I really hope, and I always tell Natalia, my ops director, she's only 26. This is going to be your company. This is going to be your company. Because, you know, I want to really establish the credibility with this company on a global scale. And um, there's a lot of great new companies that are coming up with really great ideas in various verticals. Like they're going to own this space and, I, and they're coming under our umbrella. So um, I, wanna, I want to see this company as a place that artists, it rolls off their tongue. Hey, you know, I'm going to go to Indie Advance because even if they don't do it in-house, their third party partners are all vetted. I know that any company that I use under their umbrella is going to be uh, a world-class company in a Credible company with integrity um, and safe, and they, they got our best interests in mind. And these are the only kind of companies that are coming under our umbrella, and they're going to be in, in 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 under various verticals. You know, um, yeah, I'm looking at I'm looking at off the, my pages right now on my desk. I see these companies I'm working with, but I really can't mention some of them yet. But um, but yeah, it's going to be exciting in the next uh, next six months with us. Um, so, uh, but yeah, with what I want to see in five years, I want to. I want to have Indie Advance have a great reputation um, uh, that everyone knows when they come here, they get what they paid for. They know it's got integrity um, and we have great customer service and they can talk to a person and we're not just a, a big behemoth machine like some other companies have become. Sure. Do you think you'll be uh, as hands-on in it, you know, at some point in the future? Or do you think you'll eventually kind of... No, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm going to be hands-on as long as it takes. I mean, even if I'm working part-time in three years, four years, um, uh, if I'm chairman of the, of the board type of thing, um, I still want to help direct the company in terms of, and, and still speak on panels. And, and uh, I mean, that's the way I hope it goes. Uh, and I'm writing a book right now called Corporate Fitness. And uh, that's going to be a big part of my life, I think, finishing that book. Is, is that uh, directed towards the music industry or is it just kind of general? No, it's directed towards, it's directed toward, well, I'm influenced by the music industry a great deal and I'm influenced by my martial arts a great deal. So it's really about character. The book's about individual um, accountability, responsibility, and how you live your life in a healthy way, mentally and physically and and. Um, how you develop your own personal character and how you apply that to everything in your life, from your work, to your relationships, to your school, to your, the way you write your music. I mean, it's about you. It's about, so when I say corporate fitness, it was originally, again, that title might change, but it was originally geared toward doing seminars for CEOs of companies so that their workers, the people, the managers that work for them, the vice president, et cetera, are well-adjusted, healthy, happy, and therefore a more productive worker, because if you're, if you're a happier person with character and a healthy person that you're gonna do a better job. And the, this was more cathartic for me starting to write this, I have about 25 topics. And I started writing it because I'm always trying to improve my character and try to prove myself. And it starts with the Buddha philosophy, which is Eastern martial arts philosophy, which I apply to my personal life uh, over the years, because I've been you know, I started training in 1972, and it's, it's a big part of who I am. And so I've applied this to my work ethic and to my uh, um, 
into the soul of India Vet. So the people that work with me in this company uh, understand this about me, understand uh, the philosophy and know that this is like about as important as anything is. You know, you say, you do what you say you're going to do. You do with integrity. You, you, you treat people fairly, uh, kindness, and, um, and that you take care of yourself as well, physically, mentally, spiritually, that you, 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 you try to be the best person you can be. And this is how, and, and I think the world to be a better place this way is too, which is what my teacher used to always say. If we all trained, it wouldn't be any worse. You know? <laughs> uh, that was his attitude. No, um, I, I love that. Do you, do you know have a, um, do you know about when it might be coming out? I'd love to read it. No, you know, it was supposed to be out in September. It's supposed to be out already. Yeah. <laughs> and because I started in the advance, it's taken up so much of my time, but it's, it's probably 70% done. If you go to TomCallahan.com, my other website, um, it, it talks a little bit about, about the book there at the end. In there. So, I mean, that sounds like right up the alley of the kind of stuff that I read. You know, oh, really? Like I, Good. Yeah, yeah, so. Yeah, so it's sort of a self-help book, but uh, it's really, it's not really, self, it's really about, we all know it, but a lot of times we look in the mirror and we see our own flaws, we see what we need to work on, but we ignore it. That's the problem. We, it's too, it takes effort to, to, to it, and it's incremental growth, and we're not patient with ourselves for the most part. I don't mean to digress off the topic here, I'm sorry. No, this, no, is, this is super important too. I think, I think it all relates to, you know, to everything. Anyway, so that's the culture of the company I've tried, I'm trying to build here with Indie Advance. It is a culture, and I don't want it to be the music, typical music business culture. I've been in it for 35 years, and for the most part, it sucks, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's so, um, for the most part, it's, it's, it's so much of a hustle. And everybody in our company really has, wants to do the right thing. They want to really help the artists because they know that the more artists we help on a global scale, the more we can help create that middle class you know we're not the only ones trying to do it i don't think i think everyone would like to see independent artists be able to buy a home and have a family as an artist without having three jobs and you know you know what i mean so it, 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 it's going to take time it's going to be a collective consciousness i think with everybody in it for the right reasons and uh there's still commerce being had people are still spending money people are still making money it's that one dollar that seems to go around but if we do it with the right intention uh, I think it, it helps, it, it raises all boats, right? Mm -hmm. That's the yeah. idea. That's, uh, you know, I, I think it's a great, uh, I think it's something that, that's definitely needed. And I can see how a lot of folks can benefit from that. I, I have a couple, like, as we're talking about, I have a couple people sure. I might want to send over to you. Um, I'll, I'll shoot it over in an email. Um, sure. But, um, but yeah, I think this is probably a good place to wrap up. I don't want to take too much of your Sunday. I appreciate it. Um, uh, where can people find you? Like, you know, where are your social media handles, websites, all that stuff? I'll put it in the show notes as well. But um, oh, okay, where, where do you like to talk to people? Well, uh, indieadvance.com, I-N-D-I-E is the website. And then we have, uh, uh, we just started, it's still small. I think we only have about 450 followers, Indie Advance on Instagram. Um, and then my martial arts is World of Budo Arts, World of Budo, B-U-D-O Arts on Instagram as well. Um, Facebook. Tom Callahan and and uh, and uh, Indie Advanced Community because so many Indie Advanced pages on Facebook that are inaccurate. They are mine, but I can't get them down. So Indie Advanced, I think it's Indie Advanced Community page. I think that's what it is. Um, that's the best one, and you know, just basic stuff. Okay. Uh, do you, do you? Yeah, you know, I had a question about the um, the karate too. Do you compete at all, or do you just uh, uh, not at my age anymore? In fact. I have 33 black belts coming here to Boulder on Thursday through Sunday because I'm the, I'm the All-America's Vice Chairman. That's one of my students right now. I'm the All-America's Vice Chairman uh, for the organization out of Japan. So, uh, but I'm also Chairman of the USA. And I have the USA um, Kyoka Shinkan black belts and branch chiefs coming here this week mm -hmm. for instructor camp. So it's going to be great. I can't wait. Haven't seen these guys, a lot of them, for a year and a half because of the pandemic. And um, so, yeah, I, I, I teach a particular style of karate called Kyokushin. That's a full contact style. And Kyokushin Khan is our branch of it out of Japan. So that's, uh, I spend a lot of time teaching six days a week still. Mm -hmm. I think last time we spoke, I, I told you that I recently got into boxing. Yeah. Uh, and I've 
freaking love it, man. Like I, I, I'd never been into it before. I never uh, was really that interested in the sport. Did it on a whim, and I just I fell in love with it. It's a great, it's a great workout. It's a great mm -hmm. sport. Um, it, it is technical things. It's, it's a mind body connection, which I always work on. Really, mm -hmm. it, it's really important because we kind of walk around with our brains over here and our bodies over here. They don't communicate enough, so the synapses are not connecting. Mm -hmm. And once we learn how to connect those synapses and activate the electrical system and, and are, are more aware of our body, physicality of our body, and our brain and body are speaking to each other more. Um, it actually helps everything. Mm -hmm. It helps music. It helps your, uh, helps your, it, it inspires you to, to work harder. Uh, everything. It's, you're healthier. You're, you get more oxygen to your brain. You think mm -hmm. more clearly. I mean, all these things. Physical activity is so important for a musician. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally agree. <laughs> and then one last thing, I just want to use reminding me of something. You can find this on YouTube. Uh, about five, six years ago, six, seven years ago, now, Jet Li, the uh, martial arts actor, had a, has a YouTube channel. And um, he did an interview and a documentary on me about music and martial arts. I don't care. So you, can, you can find it like Jet Li, Tom Callahan, karate or something like that. I don't mm -hmm. know how to say it. Uh, this is back when I was in Santa Monica. But that's a, if you're interested in music and martial arts, uh, I discussed that on that Jet Li documentary. I will definitely look that up. Yeah, I was much older. But I've, I've always thought there's like a connection between athletics and musicianship. Like there's, there's a lot of parallels, you know? It's, well, you know, I, and I discussed this and that, so just go watch yeah. that. It's, it, yeah, yeah. There's, a rhythm, there's a rhythm to your fighting. There's a rhythm to music, obviously. And there's a rhythm to your breath and, and, um, and all that. So, and there's a patience that you have to, you have to develop when you're fighting. You, you can't just go crazy. You have to have patience. And when you're playing in a band, you have to be patient. You have to be sensitive to the other musicians and things like mm -hmm. that. So, yeah, there's a definite symbiotic relationship there. Um, yeah, I'll, I will definitely check that out because that's something that I've like been thinking about. So I'm curious to see what uh, what it says, you know, what has to say in the video. Um, all right, cool. Well, yeah, why don't we wrap it up here? Um, yeah, man. Thank you for having me. I appreciate this, it. This has been it's great, great to man. Tons of great information. Um, Good. Appreciate you taking the time and you know sharing your story with us. Well, you're welcome, and I'll see you again. I'm looking forward to doing some work with you with your producing as well. Yeah, likewise, man. All right, All right talk soon. Take care. Thanks for tuning in and listening to another episode of About to Drop. For more info, please go to our page, www.vertigomusic, that's V-R-T-I-G-O music.com forward slash podcast. And make sure to follow and subscribe to us on YouTube and Apple Podcasts. Thanks and see you soon.